friends. My name is Barbara, and I'm here to talk to you about some maps. <clears throat> Not just any maps, though. I'm here to talk to you about a book of maps. I'm here to talk to you about the London A to Z, which is possibly the most famous index street map in the world. Uh, the London A to Z has been with us for a while. The first edition was published in 1936, and there's a really great story about how this atlas came to be that I would like to share with you. Are you ready for the story? The story also comes with some really amazing book art. The book art is actually affiliated with the musical that was produced about this story in 2014. So here it goes. I'm gonna. Phyllis Purcell, otherwise known as Mrs. P, was walking through London one night on her way to a party or on her way to a job interview. Uh, and she got lost in London, the streets were a tangled mess, she was horribly lost, so she decided that she was gonna map the streets of London. So she walked 3,000 miles to check the names of over 23,000 streets. She got up at 5 a.m. every morning, she was working 18-hour days, and she finally produced her beautiful, fully indexed street atlas of London. And nobody wanted to buy it because she was a woman who produced an atlas by herself. So she shopped the atlas on foot. She walked from store to store trying to find someone to, to be willing to distribute any copies of her atlas. And she did actually find uh, a purchaser for her atlas. W.H. Smith and Sons bought her whole initial 250 book printing of her atlas. So she delivered it to them in a wheelbarrow. That's a pretty good story, right? Like it's a good story of a woman going out there and like having a cause and, and producing a book and then, and then selling it. Um, it's almost entirely not true, <laughs> except the atlas exists. So how do we get from the story to the book? Um, so we're gonna go on a little adventure with Mrs. P, uh, starting with her childhood, actually. Uh, Mrs. P was born Phyllis, Phyllis Gross in 1906. Uh, she was the sister of the artist Anthony Gross, who's a relatively famous artist of the time. Um, and they had an unusual childhood. Um, their uh, parents had a lot of sort of interpersonal issues and um, they had a lot of sort of unusual experiences. This is actually Phyllis and apparently her pet elephant. Uh, unfortunately, Phyllis's parents' marriage dissolved. Her mother ended up institutionalized for the remainder of her life and her father emigrated to the United States. So they did what you do with children in these circumstances and sent Phyllis to art school. Uh, she was a relatively accomplished artist, and she ultimately found her way to the Sorbonne, where she met lots of uh, famous artists and writers and just, you know, a lot of interesting cross-section of society. She, um, she was particularly close with one particular author, um, and, and somewhere along the way, someone who may or may not have been Phyllis started a rumor that she was the um, subject of this author's most famous work. Um, but ultimately, she actually did end up marrying Richard Purcell, who was a, a, the brother of, excuse me, a friend of her brother's and also an artist. And she and Richard traveled around Europe um, producing art. Um, this is another work of, of uh, Phyllis's. So they, they were traveling in Spain and they were traveling in France and they were traveling in Italy. Um, and it was in Venice one night when Phyllis decided she didn't feel like being married anymore. Uh, so she got up in the middle of the night and left her husband. She went back to London, um, and this is where we come back to the maps, because her father, in 1935, reached out to her from where he had moved in the United States, just outside of New York, um, to talk about publishing a map. Like, hey, you know, we should publish this map of London. Wouldn't that be great? I have a map publishing company. You're in London. Let, let's get together and do this thing. Phyllis and her father had had a, a contentious relationship throughout her life, so um, it, it was a potentially risky project for her, but she did decide to take it on. Um, and this is where all of the walking supposedly happened, the, the 3,000 miles and the 23,000 streets, except it probably didn't. Um, Peter Barber, who was the head of maps at the British Library, says that the uh, Phyllis Purcell story is complete rubbish. There is no evidence she did it, and if she did do it, she didn't need to. Basically, Phyllis's father already had 
uh, several books of maps of London before he moved to the United States. He'd been already publishing some street atlases of London. Um, so the strong likelihood here is that what he was actually looking to do was update those with information that um, about the way the streets had changed after World War I. And even if they were looking at doing that in particular, uh, Phyllis could have easily gotten that information by going to the local council offices as opposed to walking the streets and checking the addresses by herself. So there was probably a little bit less walking involved than the sort of official story of the atlas contains. The London A to Z was also not the first street atlas that was published in London, nor was it necessarily the most comprehensive. There was another fairly comprehensive street atlas of London available when the A to Z was published um, that had been available since 1908, which is the Bar Bartholomew's Atlas. And the first street atlas of London was actually published in the 1600s. None of these things stopped the publication of the geographers A to Z, the, the street atlas that we are here to talk about. Um, so Phyllis and her father and her father's draftsman uh, did produce an atlas in 1936. And W.H. Uh, Smith and Sums were the first purchasers of the atlas. They bought the entire first run, which was a couple more than 250 books. It was on the order of 1,000. Um, whether or not Phyllis delivered it to them in a wheelbarrow is still a question for the ages. And the geographer's map company that Phyllis was running in London, publishing this atlas in London at the time, was really successful coming out of the publication of this book. So she was a woman running an atlas company in London in the 1930s, having left her husband somewhere in Italy, um, and doing all right by things. They had 12 really, really successful atlases in publication when World War II broke out in 1939, and you weren't allowed to produce local maps anymore in England. So the company stayed afloat publishing um, maps of the front of the war. So they were basically giving people sort of more of a, a, ge a geographic and cartographic expression of the war. And they limped along that way. Phyllis also took up an additional work working for the government, producing some war illustrations for them. And as the war came to a close, she actually refused long-term employment with the government to go back to her company, to keep her company going and try and make them successful again now that they were able to begin publishing maps of the, the area. So they went back to publishing ma uh, maps and atlases of London and the surrounding areas. There was unfortunately a paper shortage in the UK at the time, um, which means that they were publishing the, the maps out of Amsterdam where they could get the supplies they needed to do this. And it was coming home from, the, from Amsterdam on a, a trip to, to go to the publishing facilities in 1946 that uh, Phyllis was involved in a pretty substantial plane crash where she, she suffered some pretty significant injuries. Um, but that didn't stop her from continuing to produce maps. So now she is a woman who left her husband somewhere in the middle of Italy, who is running her own company producing maps in London, who successfully got that company through the war, who just survived a plane crash and hasn't given up just yet. The London A to Z was not the first index street atlas of London, but it did have a lot of uh, innovations and advancements to it, which is part of the reason it became so phenomenally successful. If you travel in London even now, you will often hear London cab drivers refer to oranges and lemons, and they are actually referring to streets as they are color-coded in this atlas, with the A, streets, A roads and B roads being color-coded as yellow and orange. Uh, the, the atlas also received a lot of sort of um, innovative, innovation credit for innovation around the typography that was used. There was no new typography added, but the style of typography and the way it was deployed throughout the atlas made the atlas very readable, um, and people really appreciated that about the book. The company itself also was innovative in many ways, um, and, and Phyllis was actually able to do a lot of things with this company that are surprising given the time that she was doing them as a woman running a company by herself in the 50s and 60s in London. Uh, she ultimately turned the geographer's A to, A to Z map company into a trust and donated her own shares of the company into the trust. And part of the story of the reason why she did this was to protect the employees so that they didn't have to worry about buyouts and things. She was getting older and she wanted to make sure that the employees would continue on. But really she wanted to make sure they kept making maps the way she wanted them to make maps. So part of the, the stipulation of the trust was that the company had to continue to function in the way that she wanted it to. Um, and the way that she set up this company was actually really great and has, has given the company a lot of opportunities. So they were very early explorers in using digital production methods and things like CAD to, to build better maps. Uh, 
they have a lot of digitally available maps, so they've been really innovative in getting into the web space. Um, and they actually, in part because of the sort of name brand value of the company, were the official maps dealer for the 2012 Olympics in London. So if you bought a map that was related to the Olympics, it was produced by this company. Phyllis's personal life was also really interesting at this time. She had abandoned her husband many years ago in Venice and that marriage at some point got dissolved, but it didn't mean she was alone. Uh, Phyllis spent the bulk of the, the later years of her life in the company of a woman named Esme, and Phyllis's brother, half-brother, insists that she was a lesbian. This is not something that Phyllis claimed for herself, but even if she found a romantic partner or found a platonic life partner for the end of her life, she was able to form that, that special connection and that special bond with another person in a way that was not necessarily approved of at the time. In 1983, Phyllis published her first autobiography, which was titled Fleet Street, Tight Street, Queer Street. It's possible Phyllis was trying to tell us something with the title of this book. That book has gone out of print. The version of Phyllis's autobiography that you can still purchase today is A to Z Maps, The Personal Story, From Bedsitter to Household Name. This book was published in 1990, and here is where you find uh, a large part of the narrative of the early story we heard about Phyllis, where she's talking about walking all of the streets and, and indexing all of the, the street names. So Phyllis actually wrote her own story, and that has become the popular story. And the story is hugely popular. It is so popular that the town that she was born in awarded her the, the um, famous blue plaque for historical significance for inventing the London A to Z. The city of London did not actually award her any of these blue plaques because they find the story to be a little questionable. But people love this story so much that, um, that her na local neighborhood put this on the, the house where she was born. And I have to say personally, Phyllis maybe didn't deserve this for maps. She maybe didn't do a ton of stuff in cartography that was super innovative, but she refused to settle for a life she didn't want. She built the life she preferred to have instead, and she protected her own legacy, not only by the way that she treated her company, but by the fact that she literally wrote her own version of her story. And that's pretty badass in my mind. So I want to leave you all with something to hold on to from Phyllis um, for, for those days that are maybe not so great for, for all of you adventurers um, and questers and, and rebels out there. Um, Phyllis would often say to people in her company when maybe they were, were struggling or, or just had to resolve something or move forward, um, on we go. So on those days where this is dragging you down, um, think of Phyllis writing her own story and think about what you want to say. And, and on we go, friends, on we go.